Uh, this just conference sound. will now be recorded. So we're going to start with just uh, yes. some announcements, and then what we'll do, since uh, we're manage still a manageable size group, we'll go around the screen and just uh, allow people to introduce themselves uh, uh, briefly uh, for whatever uh, you know networking benefits that might. Uh, result in. Um, and I suppose in terms of instructions, Diane may have some others, but uh, I suppose if people could um, uh, mute their mics uh, uh, in general, uh, except when you when you, ne you need or want to speak. Um, and uh, if there's, you can use the chat to get somebody's attention if you if, if if you need to do that, or if you really need to get somebody's attention, you can unmute yourself and, and shout out. Uh, we will try to have the question and answer as we normally do at the end of the formal part of the presentation by our by our two panelists. So why don't we start by going around? I should probably say. Yeah, I, you probably all know me and we can see our names up there on the screen. I'm John Prespior. I'm a, on the board of Greening USA uh, with the official title of vice president. So uh, I want to just uh, thank everybody for being here. I'll go around my screen as I see everybody's faces. Uh, Greening USA and Diane is up next. Uh, yes, Diane Brandley, and you probably all know who I am as well. Um, Founding member and, and hanger on and 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 operating more technology than I ever thought I would. So here we are. Um, I, I would like to to. Oh, did Jeff jump off? Oh my gosh. Okay, I was going to introduce Jeff. Oh, there he is, Jeff. I can, I'm Jeff here. is our membership chair, and Jeff does an awesome job of shameless self-promotion so please Jeff. <laughs> thanks Dan yes uh, my name is Jeff Anthony I am the membership chair looking at the list I think about half to three quarters are already members so it falls upon deaf ears but uh, I just want to encourage anyone uh, who is not a member to consider becoming one because we uh, are all volunteer staff and we rely only on uh, uh, membership and donation. So uh, I think we've done a really good job recently of adapting uh, to this COVID and uh, uh, really brought some interesting things online. Uh, not to say the green bag lunches weren't interesting, but uh, I think we've been able to reach more people. So uh, that's all. I, like I said, most of you are, are probably already members, but uh, uh, my position, I work in home uh, residential uh, energy performance. I'm going to go try to cram a whole bunch of appointments into the afternoon because we finally have a nice day. Uh, but uh, glad to see everyone here and glad to um, have these green bag lunches. So I'll pass, pass the stick. Oh, uh, thanks, uh, Jeff. And I, I apologize for having to leave my station here for a second. The doorbell rang. I, I'm expecting a package from Apple sometime today, and I didn't want it to be sitting out on the front of porch. But um, uh, and, and I'm sorry I missed Di Diane's announcement. I want to be sure that we just give everybody a heads up to what we're trying to arrange for January. Did you mention that, Diane? I, I did not. We're working on something that could be very special, but we have some some wrinkles to iron out with it first. But uh, there is a documentary film that we are trying to bring to upstate New York. And it's about collaboration between native people of the North America and South America on environmental issues. And it's a pretty compelling documentary. Uh, still working on the wrinkles, but the look for more information hopefully we'll be able to bring that to you and then so we would have a, a film screening of that documentary separately on our green bag lunch day we would have a green bag lunch discussion we already have a couple of leaders of the Onondaga Nation along with Lindsay Spear who have already stepped up to be panelists so that would really be a really significant conversation about you know moving forward and collaborating so watch for that yeah, so what you would do is watch the film on your own. We'd give you the link and then the following, I guess the following day, it will be on a, on a, on a Friday, a typical uh, green, green bag lunch spot. We would have the panel discussion. So so thanks, Diane. Uh, next, I see uh, Jabad, did I pronounce that right? 
You can unmute yourself and just introduce yourself if you wish. Going, going once, going twice. <coughs> All right, I'm gonna move on. I'm waiting for a name from somebody. And I and next on my screen is Amy, but I'll introduce our speakers later. Then we have Allison Bodine. Can you, can you uh, unmute Allison? If that will just just saw uh, in the in the chat, John. Uh, she's Allison's the her microphone's not working uh, set up yet. So she, Allison's the planner with the Syracuse Onondaga County Planning Agency. Uh, th thanks a lot, Frank. I'm glad you were uh, watching the chat. Next, I see Darlene. Yes, I think I'm unmuted. Yep. Yep. Um, hello. Hi, I'm Darlene Devendorf, and I am a um, I am home because I am a retired edu science educator, and um, I work with the uh, local science teachers um, organization, um, Stanies, the uh, central chapter, and uh, I get uh, the TACNI uh, email, so that's how I got. Um, notice of this and um and which i did share with the section but as i was saying to john earlier uh 12 noon on a friday might be a tough thing for teachers but thank goodness it's being recorded um so and i'm i'm interested in this topic so i thought i'd jump on thanks starlane steve yeah i'm uh i'm just uh environmentally concerned citizen right Are you, do you live in the skinny alice area no i live in uh fairmount area but okay, uh welcome. i i get out to all the finger lakes uh as much as i can well thanks thanks for joining in today uh howie frequent flyer here green bag lunch Hi, Howie Hollander. I'm a retired Lockheed Martin engineer uh, involved with a number of uh, STEM outreach and advocacy organizations, including the Technology Alliance for Central New York. I'm the person who sent Darlene that email. Um, I'm to come yeah, fill my day with uh, Greening USA uh, meeting. Thanks, Howie. Uh, 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 Rick Smartin, uh, one of our speakers from uh, last month. Rick? Good, good afternoon. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm supposed to be retired, but I'm doing a really lousy job at it. Um, I'm also chairman of the Central New York Land Trust, and we hope to be working with Frank in the future in terms of Skinny Atlas Lake work. Thanks, Rick, for being here. Bob Haley. Oh, thank you. Welcome and good health to everyone. Um, I'm uh, an architect and a longtime passionate um, about the environment. Um, it's good to see uh, Frank again and all those who have been pulling for sustainable greening bag, green bag USA. I would like to say, Frank, that even this morning at our focus board meeting, we mentioned this seminar and that people should check into it. And uh, also, we have a, a forum series next Friday. We've had six of these now open webinars from Focus Greater Syracuse. And just for anyone's information, next Friday at noon, that's 12.18 at noon, we'll have uh, and we, uh, a subject of uh, mental health in the time of COVID. And uh, just go to the FOCUS website, register, and expand the impact of all of our collective efforts here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Barry Carr. Good morning, everyone. I'm Barry Carr. I'm the Executive Director of Clean Communities of Central New York. And um, we are a function uh, subgroup of the U.S. Department of Energy focused on the use of alternative fuels in transportation. Thanks, Barry, for being here. Sh Sharam? Yeah, this is Ram Shavastava. I'm President of Larson Engineers in Rochester, New York. Uh, quite a bit involved with civil, environmental, and renewable energy these days with community solar farms. Thanks for being with us today. Appreciate it. And David Ashley. Hello, everybody. I'm Dave Ashley. I'm a 
uh, Emeritus Partner of Ashley McGraw Architects and a longtime member of Greening USA. Also an Emeritus uh, Board Member of Greening USA, mm -hmm. our, uh, our, our, our founder. Camille? Here, maybe you, you, you need to unmute. Oh, uh, I just saw something. Camille said her internet's uh, a little, little uh, dicey today, hoping it's going to hold out for the presentation. But Camille is the um, Cornell Cooperative Extension Onondaga County representative who um, it does uh, you know, work for Onondaga County, but also specifically focused on uh, Skinny Atlas Lake and doing some education and outreach there as well. Okay, thanks. Working, sir. Yep, sure thing. Thanks, Frank. And Liz Moran, I haven't seen you in a long time. Uh, can you say hello? I can. Uh, hi, John. It's it's nice to see you too. Um, I'm Liz Moran from Ecologic, and we uh, are happy to be here uh, listening in. Um, we do a lot of watershed related work and linology uh, planning across the Finger Lakes and are looking forward to getting started uh, on a project for the um, uh, the water quality model to support the nine element plan for um, Skinny Atlas Lake. So Ecologics on that project team and part of our assignment is to kind of keep track of stakeholders and who's doing what. So this is a great opportunity for me. And I just jumped on the, I just saw the announcement come by this morning. So jumped on, so thank you. Well, I'm glad you're uh, with us. If I would have known you were involved in that, we would have uh, added you to the panel, but you'll get an opportunity to share any of your expertise. And if we need to have you back sometime, we will uh, give you a holler. Um, Melanie? Uh, yes, good morning. Um, I am I am present. Um, I am I, I am most concerned at the moment of simply getting um, some advantage of the Heat Smart program before the deadline at the end of the year. So but great, like thanks, Melanie. thanks, Melanie. Mel Melanie is one of our board members and is also a uh, uh, a, a, a lab uh, tech. I'm not sure if that's the right word. Uh, working on uh, on samples. Uh, Oh, COVID, COVID mean, and, yes. uh, and other oh, things. Yes. Uh, Javad, uh, I see you there. I don't know if you... Hello, everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, my name is Javad Shafi. Actually, I am talking from across the Atlantic Sea, and uh, I'm a, I'm a uh, water resources engineer. Thanks for being here today. Tom Muse. Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? I had a little little late to arrive here, but I work as a biologist at the state parks out of the Jamesville office with New York State Parks. Oh, great. Thanks for being here. And I see Dave Coburn has, uh, has, uh, has joined us uh, too. Dave? Yep. Uh, retired from the Onondaga County Office of Environment and on the board with the County Soil and Water Conservation District. Great, thanks for being here. So today our program, as everybody knows, protecting the Skinny Atlas Lake watershed progress and challenges. Frank and Amy are going to talk to us. I don't even know which of you are going first, but uh, let me just say a couple of words about both of you and then uh, I'll turn it over um, to you. Uh, uh, Frank uh, is the uh, uh, the new executive director, um, new since uh, uh, May of 2019 at the Skinny Atlas uh, Lake Association. As most of you know, he previously served as a director of community engagement and organizational advancement at Focus uh, Greater Syracuse. Um, 
is uh, has degrees from SUNY Environmental Science and Forestry and Environmental Policy and Management. He also attended Paul Smith's College, uh, where he studied water and lake ecology. So uh, uh, we we're thankful for, for Frank to uh, for being here today. Um, he's also worked at the Montezuma. Uh, uh, the Montezuma Audubon Center in Wayne and Seneca counties, and he helped establish the Onondaga Lake Conservation Corps. So thanks, uh, Frank. Uh, Amy and, and, and Frank helped to organize this session and reached out to Amy, who also volunteered uh, to, to join in. Amy's the watershed coordinator uh, for the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Finger Lakes uh, Water Hub. Um, she uh, also um, serves uh, as the Onondaga Lake Watershed Coordinator for the New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. Um, uh, previously, she's uh, held positions at the Center of, of Excellence, uh, working in the Sustainable Community Solutions uh, Group. Uh, she assisted on the Save the Rain uh, program there. Amy has degrees in environmental studies from St. Lawrence University and also attended for a short while American University in Washington, D.C. and their international environment and the development um, program. So with these, uh, we have two uh, wonderful uh, people here who with experience in, 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 in water um, environment and sustainability and I'm so thrilled that uh, Frank and Amy volunteered to be with us today to tell us uh, from their perspective what they see going on there in, uh, in Skinny Atlas. So Frank, is it you gonna go first? Are you gonna go first? Yeah, I, I, only cause I'm gonna give a little background, otherwise it, uh, it would go either way, but um, I'll try and set the stage for Amy as best I can. I know she's got some, I uh, saw some of her slides today and looking forward to her presentation. I know she's got some great, uh, great news to share and information. Um, so thank you, uh, Diane. Thank you, John, and all the uh, Green USA uh, leadership uh, for this opportunity to engage. Uh, we, we, you know, historically have been engaging a lot with the Skinny Atlas Lake watershed uh, community, but at the same time, uh, as I'll be mentioning a bit more later, uh, Skinny Atlas Lake is the drinking water source for the city of Syracuse and, and surrounding communities uh, throughout central New York. Um, so I, I thought this was a nice opportunity to uh, connect uh, with with some more folks in the city of Syracuse. Uh, great to see a lot of familiar faces uh, from my time at Focus, working with Audubon uh, and, and at ESF uh, for sure. Um, and I hope everyone's well and safe and all your friends and family are uh, doing well uh, during this time. Um, and we're hoping to get out of the woods soon. Um, so uh, my best to everyone and, and holiday wishes to you as well. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, see how we get going here. Um, I've got a few slides and uh, John, um, how long do I have? I wanna keep an eye on the clock as best I can. Um, yeah, you know, I didn't uh, get into the details of that with you and Amy, so I don't know how much you have, but we usually like to wrap up our program by 1.30, and that includes some um, uh, a period of time of question and answers. So maybe, you know, by 1 o'clock or 1.10 or 1.15, we'd like to be able to engage in questions from the audience if they have any. Um, so uh, take what you need to do it, but just leave us some time to uh, ask, ask some questions. Okay, I thank you. That's very helpful. And um, some of what I'm sharing today is also on our uh, website, which is uh, skinnyatlaslake.org, uh, um, and uh, you can see more uh, more comprehensive look if you click on. We had our annual meeting August 25th. Um, certainly, there's uh, been some updates since then that uh, I'm sharing today. Um, but if you want to uh, learn learn more in depth, uh, that's a, a great a great place to start. Um, speaking of starting, uh, so this is normally I'm actually in our office today. I've uh, been working out of a different uh, home office uh, uh, in the village. Uh, in full disclosure, there's uh, my my dad's in Florida, and he has a has a place that I can work uh, safely from the 
Uh, we are normally, uh, out, you know, when COVID's not happening, um, at uh, the St. James Episcopal Church, uh, we are leasing some space uh, in their offices. It's a great spot. Um, you know, really couldn't do any better. Uh, looking, uh, we're on the north end near the village, so central to a lot of the uh, activities of uh, the community, but also um, folks coming through the community as well. Uh, but we are uh, representing the entire lake watershed, uh, which I'll talk more about. But uh, hopefully with uh, things uh, getting better uh, and, and when the church uh, opens up to the public, uh, we'd love to uh, see folks stopping by at that point. Um, a little overview of today's presentation. Um, I'll be giving a little bit of the history and background snapshot of the lake. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on addressing algal blooms um, from the Skinny Atlas Lake Association perspective. I know Amy's going to be uh, speaking uh, a little bit, uh, quite a bit to that. Uh, that effect uh, in her presentation to uh, a few plans for the future and community engagement. And I'll save questions obviously until uh, after uh, Amy has uh, presented as well. Uh, we'll stick around. Um, just a little bit on some of the uh, facts here. Uh, just a snapshot of the history of you know, the Pleistocene era. Uh, was as that ended, uh, the glaciers receded, and that's when we uh, had our wonderful Finger Lakes and other lakes in New York um, uh, were, um, uh, excuse me, were developed. And uh, then later on, uh, uh, we started to see more impact from uh, human activities in uh, starting in 1881. Uh, and the lake was then dammed. Uh, you can see this little uh, nook here. So where my cursor is, if that's I'm not sure if that's coming up, um, but if you see this on the um, left uh, west side of the lake, uh, there's a little uh, little hook with a with a cove, and that's about where the lake used to um, uh, have its natural uh, northern part of it before um, uh, before the, it was dammed up. So this northern portion is uh, extremely shallow, which is which does come into play when we're talking about uh, algal blooms popping up and where they're popping up. Um, so uh, a few more facts, I'll, I'll try and go quickly through here, but uh, the surface area of the lake is about 13.6 miles. Uh, we are home to about 2,600 residents, uh, or residences, excuse me, uh, and about where a thousand of them are around the uh, 35 mile um, you know, circumscribed shoreline. Uh, and the total watershed area is 59 square miles. Uh, and I think I've got a redundancy there, so I'll skip that one. Um, and next slide, it, uh, this is kind of the breakdown of the land use of the uh, watershed, um, where about 48% is agricultural, 40% uh, is open forest. And by the way, I uh, Dave Matthews from the Upstate Freshwater Institute did some preliminary modeling that that mentioned uh, once a watershed hits, he's I think studied over 400 lakes throughout New York State and found uh, Liz Moran might know know this uh, well too, but uh, found that uh, when a watershed hits over 65% of forested area, uh, that's when we see a significant or start to see a threshold of not maybe not significance, but a decrease of uh, the intensity or toxicity of harmful algal blooms and the frequency of them. Um, but I'll have to check with Dave on that on that stat. I just thought that was pretty interesting, and that's where uh, folks like Rick Smartin and the Central New York Land Trust and Figure Lakes Land Trust and the uh, New York State Agricultural uh, uh, Land Trust come into play uh, in helping make sure we have good vegetation around the lake. Uh, probably while I was speaking, I hope everyone uh, maybe read those other uh, stats too. So I'll keep moving along. And here's a little bit in regards to uh, the history with the city of Syracuse and um, the uh, Skinny Atlas Lake as a drinking water source. Um, so in 1894, it was established. Uh, and then I believe later, about 25 years later, uh, there was a second pipe put in, uh, which is I believe near Shotwell Creek on the east side. Um, I think somewhere between 1910 and 1913, actually. Uh, so maybe my math's not the best. Let's call that about 20 years. Um, 
And uh, you know, the, here's some uh, stats on the amount of water um, that the uh, city of Syracuse is, um, you know, can utilize up to. Uh, there is a threshold. Um, and then how much gets discharged, uh, you know, to the creek, uh, and uh, how much is used uh, by the village as well. So a lot of water. Um, so that's a little bit about the the history and background of the lake. Um, certainly, uh, the city of Syracuse Water Department. Any any questions? Uh, getting into the details of of their work, uh, I would uh, say to uh, either um, direct that to uh, Commissioner of Water, uh, Joseph Awald, or Rich Abbott, uh, who's the City of Syracuse Water Department's uh, Watershed Quality Coordinator for Skinny Atlas Lake, uh, who's you know, out in the lake all the time and got a great team doing great work. Uh, we work very closely. Uh, there's uh, very good New York State protections uh, under public health law that allows the City of Syracuse to protect its water throughout the watershed. Uh, so they do have jurisdiction uh, throughout um, our entire watershed. If you can see behind me, that's probably a better um, shot. I'll try and show if you can, if anyone can still see my, um, my, my image on my video here. Um, but this is our, our watershed. We've got, um, it's the uh, village of Skinny Atlas I mentioned, but also the town of Skinny Atlas, um, a bit of the town of Wasco, a bit of the town of Marcellus. Uh, but also uh, town of Niles, Sempronius, town of Scott, town of Spafford. And we're in three different counties, uh, mostly Onondaga County, but also uh, Cayuga County and Cortland County. So there's, uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of coordination that needs to be done. Uh, and hopefully, as I was speaking uh, on, about the watershed, you had a chance to read about uh, the Skinny House Lake Association's mission on the screen as well. Uh, just a snapshot of our history. Uh, we were founded, established in 1969. Uh, so we're over a 50 year old um, uh, operation, uh, mostly been volunteer uh, until uh, 2018 when my predecessor, Rachel DeWitt was hired uh, as the first executive director. And Rachel went on to uh, Scripps uh, out in California and continuing her education, I believe, uh, she's heading down to Washington, D.C. soon. We, uh, She was back in the community a bit. We uh, contracted her to do some nice work on uh, developing a story map and uh, a lake manual uh, to move that. So we're looking forward to uh, sharing more about that in the future uh, and getting that out to everyone. Um, and a few things of name changes, but really um, it was uh, the mid 90s uh, when we started seeing aquatic invasive species take hold. I think it was actually late 70s we had milfoil for the first time, but then uh, started to see in 2001, we did a survey between 2001 and 2006. This is actually, I think we started 2007 uh, where we had a full year of the management program. 2006 was when we started readying uh, for our, our milfoil management program, which I'll talk about. Uh, it's an invasive species we're working to get rid of. Uh, 2012, we uh, decided we didn't want to see any more, uh, do our best to not see any more uh, invasives come into the lake. Uh, so we established uh, one of the first programs in New York State to help prevent um, aquatic invasive species at the boat launches uh, and continue to improve it and work with folks like Finger Lakes Prism to. Uh, you know, learn from each other as well as uh, Lake George um, and looking nationwide to some of the best management practices to improve that. Um, and then 2017 is really, uh, that that's what sparked our leadership to hire a full-time executive director because uh, we just need to put, especially with the city of Syracuse and drinking water in mind, we, we really need to, it has to be all pistons firing, everybody in the community working to, um, address harmful algal blooms, uh, which, which I'll speak a little bit more about as we go along. Um, so this is, uh, I believe, from an uh, article from Glenn Coyne uh, back uh, in August. Um, and this was talking about a, a hot summer. And this was three days before uh, we actually experienced our, our first algal bloom. This is our earliest uh, small localized algal bloom uh, on record for the season was August 10th. Um, you know, not lake-wide, uh, thank goodness, 
So 2017, uh, September 25th, we had a lake-wide um, uh, reported confirmed uh, harmful algal bloom. There is uh, historical documentation of some things happening in the past might not have been known what it was, uh, and they are all uh, you know anecdotal observations of you know these small blooms. But but something uh, as far as being officially reported as being lake-wide wasn't until. Uh, 2017, and then in 2018 and 19 and 20, uh, we've we've had these small localized uh, um, algal blooms that kind of uh, appear and then uh, will dissipate within a half hour to an hour. Uh, but we can uh, talk a little more about that. Um, this is a, a photo uh, from my first uh, harmful algal bloom. Uh, that I experienced since I started with the Skinnyals Lake Association. This this photo is um, uh, Robert G. Werner, Dr. Werner, uh, sadly uh, passed away this year, and he's going to be um, again sadly missed. Uh, and he was our our wonderful in-house uh, limnologist and uh, an emeritus of uh, uh, SUNY ESF, uh, who was my you know I never had him as a professor at ESF, but I feel like I had, uh, you know, uh, the best times with him as as my own personal professor as I was taking on the job. Uh, anything lake related, he was uh, a great go to. Um, and and down here, this is Bill Dean uh, snagging a sample. So this was, I believe, uh, the Tuesday after uh, Labor Day in 2019. Uh, we we started to see this. I was just the day after the state fair closed that year. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, Amy will talk a little bit more about our uh, algal bloom uh, monitoring program, but I will touch on it. We have about uh, 34 zones. Um, this is roughly how our process works. We're, you know, so the first thing is what to do about algal blooms addressing is, we'll, is to first look out for them and to engage our lake community, uh, you know, from the north to the south, east and west, uh, to keep an eye out um, for when they pop up so we can get the information out uh, for our community to uh, function and know to, uh, you know, as the DEC will say, is uh, know it, avoid it, report it. Um, and so we also, this what's new this past year is we trained the Mid Lakes Navigation Team, most might know as the um, uh, op operators for the um, Judge Ben Wiles and the Barbara, which is the mail boat or dinner boat um, on Skinny House Lake. Uh, some familiar with programs on Onondaga Lake uh, may know the Amita 2 uh, that was operated under Mid Lakes. Um, but uh, Mid Lakes, they're all, we had sessions uh, where we um, uh, trained them and provided the training to them uh, to keep an eye out. Uh, so we have extra uh, eyes on the lake where during their operations where uh, the judge goes multiple times during the week around the northern end and then the mail boat will circumscribe the um, the shallows or the littoral zone littoral zone of the of the lake uh, of the entire lake um, so if something's seen either our trained volunteer observes or someone from the boat uh, notifies us and then we send a trained volunteer to verify and, and send photos into the DEC. Uh, they'll visually uh, confirm that. And once that's visually, uh, you know, that I'll reach out to Amy and, and, and our others in the community. Um, and then we'll get news out to the community so they know what's going on. Uh, Amy, feel free to correct me later <laughs> on this if this anything uh, doesn't look 100% uh, accurate on, on how our program uh, works. Um, a little bit snapshot of this past year, we, we as everyone knows, uh, paying attention to the weather, we didn't have a lot of rain, very dry, and, and rain is a big concern when uh, nutrients load in uh, in our streams. We have over 150 streams uh, on Skinny Atlas Lake that can all uh, load in. Uh, phosphorus is our, our main concern for nutrient loading. Uh, so we had very little of that this summer, but there is this phenomenon when the strong south winds get going, uh, pushing to the north or any, uh, or even going north to south, but um, but mostly going from south to north. Um, that that wind action can uh, resuspend some some of these uh, in lake uh, solids, and and 
concentrate them to the north. And that's uh, pretty indicative here where we um, noticed um, you know, some happening uh, near the uh, Skinny Alice Country Club. Uh, there's a, you know, that's where that point is by the shallow. So there's an actual, uh, you know, where it goes from deeper to shallower. So that's kind of, a, you know, things can slow down there. And then uh, we saw algal blooms hit the north wall, uh, pop up, you know, again, like I said, within a half hour, hour would, you know, come up and then, and then dissipate. Or if the wind shift sometimes because it, these algal blooms float on top. I, I've been talking about algal blooms a lot, and I know Amy's going to be talking about that, but I, I forgot to preface that. Uh, what is a harmful algal bloom? Real quickly, it's it's uh, cyanobacteria. Uh, it's been around for eons. Um, it's evolved very well, uh, but they, it's a blue-green algae. And uh, what we're concerned about is microcystis colonies uh, specifically and that can produce microcystin, which is a known liver toxin. Um, so that's, that's the big to-do, why, why we're concerned about these algal blooms for uh, quality of drinking water, but also quality of life and recreation and livelihoods around the lake. Um, there can be a lot of anxieties uh, and, and a lot of need to address this and, and take care of it. So the first part is to make sure we're, uh, we're knowing where they, we've got eyes on the lake. Uh, we, we find out where it's happening. We inform as quick as we can, getting the facts out uh, so our community can uh, have that information to function accordingly uh, with, with the recommendations that the DEC and Department of Health provide. Uh, certainly there's more on our website uh, related to that too. Um, and so once you know, you know, we monitor to make sure we know where it's happening, but, but then also the uh, addressing of it uh, and I'm sorry, a, a little bit of the bottom of my screen is cut off. Um, so I'll, the bottom three pictures, uh, you have um, uh, Jennifer Graham from the USGS, Amy Klinkhammer in the middle bottom going from left to right. So Jennifer and then Amy Klinkhammer in the middle. Uh, and then this is Mike Kelly in the bottom uh, right corner uh, from IBM, uh, you know, involved with Rick Rallier from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute uh, working on the Jefferson project. Uh, they're paying close attention. Uh, they're out of Lake George. Uh, you know, they're out, at least the Jefferson project is uh, looking at, um, you know, algal blooms and when ours hit in 2017, that's when in 2018, the Jefferson project wanted to uh, learn more about um, our lake. And I didn't mention earlier how Skinny House Lake is considered a legotrophic. Uh, which is just the fancy word for saying we're not, uh, we're, we're uh, very low in nutrients uh, and we're, and as far as nutrients go, a younger lake, uh, you can go from uh, oligotrophic to mesotrophic to eutrophic. And um, that eutrophic is kind of your, your filled, almost your filled in pond that can uh, start to look like, uh, you know, start to head towards being more of a, a wetland area. Um, if it's really filled <laughs> with, with nutrients. Um, so that's a little there. Anyways, this was our, uh, you might recognize this as the Center of Excellence where Green USA has had many green bag lunches, uh, but we want to, we've con we convene and collaborate our science uh, to have uh, data decision, uh, data-driven decision-making. Uh, so we, we try our best to uh, coordinate and collaborate with what we're learning together. Um, and uh, to, to see how uh, the science can help us address these algal blooms. Uh, the Skinny Lake Association uh, does uh, contract um, uh, Syrac with Syracuse University uh, to do some um, uh, you know, stream studies and, uh, and tributary monitoring, looking at the external loaders uh, for nutrients. Uh, if you, I've listed the majors, uh, these are the, uh, streams uh, that have the probably the largest subwater sheds uh, loading into the lake, and that's where uh, Dave Matthews and team at Upstate Upstate Fresh Water Institute have really, uh, you know, produced a lot of data. Uh, they're e they're e lab certified, so um, their data uh, can be used uh, well and be part of this nine element plan that uh, Amy will be talking about more. And then we look to learn more about uh, some, uh, it says minor tributaries, but these tributaries are, are, are only minor in, in comparison to these uh, four majors. 
as well. But uh, we wanted to pick uh, these uh, tributaries or streams uh, to be representative of other streams. There's 150 streams plus, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we it, it would be extremely onerous to uh, study each one. So we've got to make some assumptions based on what we know. So we tried to pick a portfolio of uh, these other streams to um, you know then help with some of the um, you know plugins to hopefully uh, see some value in modeling to understanding uh, the rest of our uh, stream watersheds. Um, on the right here, um, this is Dr. The, uh, uh, back at Dr. Charlie Driscoll and some interns, but uh, this is a uh, wet uh, wet bulk um, precipitation um, collector. So we're looking at uh, phosphorus can actually be in uh, rain and snow and uh, enter directly onto that 13.6 mile surface area of the lake. Um, so we want to try and understand our phosphorus budget uh, quite a bit more. Uh, here's some uh, some graphs and charts on uh, you know these these streams that uh, Syracuse University is looking at to start to understand uh, turbidity nitrogen loading but again uh, looking at phosphorus which can help drive where uh, to give uh, more attention uh, to the streams that uh, need um, need some help um, and need to be addressed the other air uh, thing that we're really excited that we've contracted with Bloom Optics on recently um, is to tar start to understand a visual representation of sediment uh, loading at the mouths of the streams. Um, you know, when we have our streams turn into chocolate milk after strong rain events or spring thaws combined with uh, rain, those rain events, um, you know, we we want to start to understand and you know a picture's worth a thousand words and and drone videos can be sometimes with multi-spectral analysis can be worth a million um and so we pared down we looked at some uh we did some pre-assessment on the northern end uh you know only reason being is that when we have to mobilize the drones for our pilot uh there is uh you know you want to hit it in a window before these uh sediment plumes dissipate uh, so you, you only have a little bit of a window with the drone team to get around, uh, you know, to some some specific lakes. And we pared it down. Uh, I should update this image, but we are looking at um, these three on the east side, uh, Five Mile Point, Willow Brook, and Shotwell Brook. And then uh, the fourth would be Fisher Brook. And, and Fisher, if you uh, noticed in before, both Fisher and Five Mile, um, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, preliminarily uh, showed uh, some increased phosphorus and then Shotwell Brook certainly uh, is important um, for uh, it being close to the intake pipes uh, for the city of Syracuse. So the, the notion is to uh, see what we can uh, better understand through this multi-spectral analysis of, of the plumes and, and, then, and then also compare it to um, satellite uh, data. So we're working with ESF with Dr. Baram Salehi uh, using what's called these shoebox satellites that can get um, uh, pretty close imagery and and start to compare what we might be finding visually from the the, the drone data and and seeing how that is um, you know related to what we're seeing in satellites. And the hope is that if we get some good pilot data, uh, good pilot study data, that perhaps we could, um, based on the, those findings, start to uh, extrapolate, um, you know, the uh, understanding of those plume, sediment plumes better based on the satellite imagery of, of all the um, tributaries. I, I hope that makes sense. Um, so it's, it's basically transcribing findings from drones uh, when, when they're, um, you know, plugged in with the satellites to see if we can, again, uh, make some assumptions. Um, so I'm uh, happy to you know, answer more questions on that. I could talk about this project for, for quite a bit, but we're excited. We, we have yet to, we've done a lot of the preliminary, but we haven't had, as I mentioned, we haven't had a lot of rain. Uh, so the next, uh, when we actually go out and get the data, it will probably most likely be, uh, we're looking for a spring thaw with combined with rain. And I'm happy to report that uh, we've uh, recently engaged with Dave Icorn. 
uh, who's going to be helping us with our forecasting uh, of understanding four or five days out that, that we're ready to mobilize our drone team uh, to do an extended, he's going to help with the extended forecast to mobilize a drone team, but also on on site stream samplers uh, to um, uh, you know ground truth some of the uh, spectral analysis as well. Um, so very exciting project, more to come. Uh, the technology is wonderful. Um, and then uh, some of our internal loading. Um, this is uh, Dr. Chris Schultz uh, out of Syracuse University with Charlie Driscoll um, and and various grad students. Um, have done some transects uh, and looking at what the phosphorus sediment is like in that's already in the lake. So if you saw earlier the uh, the lake depth, uh, I believe the lakes you know started out 600 feet, but now it's 300 feet. So there's about 300 feet of um, you know sediment uh, that, and we're trying to understand how. It, if and how the uh, in-lake sediment could be getting mobilized. We're starting to see some more results there, but how that can get mobilized and, and um, you know, be a feeder uh, to these algal blooms as well. Um, the other thing is that plants can take up nutrients, but then there's seasonal, or in the case of hydrilla over at Cuga Lake, um, they could be chemically um, uh, managed where it could kill off, um, kill off those plants and possibly release more nutrients that could uh, you know, feed the algal blooms as well. Uh, but, and then this was, we just got some data and we're gonna continue to do this. This is um, Charlie built out of the uh, lab shop, uh, the sediment flux chambers. So this is uh, how to under, better understand how the sediment moves from the uh, lake bottom uh, into the system and can be uh, different, um, uh, you know, whether it's total phosphorus or soluble, uh, active phosphorus. Um, I'm probably botching some of the technology, tech, technical terms there. Amy's going to have to address that too. But basically, uh, looking at how, if and how, the uh, sediment in the lake can uh, mobilize and, and become part of the ecosystem uh, and, and possibly uh, be a food source for these algal blooms, if that makes sense. Um, and then, so as we better understand our phosphorus, um, I hope I'm not, I might be cutting into Amy's time. I am going to pick up the pace a little bit looking at the time, but um, we, we need to look at how we can uh, improve the watershed, uh, uh, you know, on, on the upland sites. We know nutrients are still going in, so we want to reduce uh, those amount of nutrients. And I'm going to um, uh, quickly, well, let me highlight, this is kind of a, a low-hanging fruit project we've done um, with the Soil Water Conservation District, where we um, had a, we see a lot of these fire lanes or private roads uh, throughout Skinny House Lake that have ditches and culverts. Um, and uh, we hope that a program where if a lot of these private roads uh, that have multiple uh, residences on them or these fire lanes uh, have these, uh, you know, microcosms of homeowners associations that have road committees and have budgets that they share to uh, make improvements uh, to their long, long driveway that they share. Um, and sometimes when that work and those upgrades happen, uh, it, it leaves this uh, barren uh, exposed soil, which is something the city of Syracuse and all of us want to reduce uh, exposed soil that can move into the system. Uh, so what happens is the Soil Water Conservation District uh, has a, uh, works with hydro a hydro seeding uh, truck uh, that comes through, and we May through October generally, uh, and then uh, they'll spray this, and then you'll see the vegetation take hold and get some roots in there, so that soil can't um, and those sediments and nutrients can't get into the lake. So that's just a very very simple thing that we uh, where you had a fire lane that made the improvements with their funds, and then we. Um, you know, partnered with the Soil Water Conservation District and basically went half and half on the, the cost of hydro seeding. So simple things, but then also there's uh, some some bigger projects we're uh, you know looking to take on. And I'll um, share another part of my screen um, just to give an overview. Um, if everyone, let's see, it might be a little delay. There we are. Um, so I just want to show you a few layers of some of our activities. These are some of our candidate sites. 
Um, you know, Ten Mile Creek, this is uh, an area where Central New York Land Trust has some land. Uh, we've uh, visited the sites there, looking at the below and above. Uh, there's an agricultural farm above that uh, is doing some good work with Soil Water Conservation District for uh, improving their management practices and uh, holding back nutrients. Uh, there's these steep ravines that come through, um, uh, you know, where Central New York Land Trust and Lourdes Camp, for those that know that area, uh, and, and so what do you do for ravines and, um, and helping improve the watershed where it's just so steep, sometimes it's cut down to the bedrock. So there's not a lot of uh, what's known as stream stabilization projects you can do in those steeps. But, but what's interesting is a lot also what we have along these, you can see these steep gouges in, these, in the map on the southern end where you know that the velocity can really get ripping through. And that's also where we have our, our hemlocks. Our hemlock trees are helping keep streams cool. And you know, so the warm temperatures, I didn't mention that these uh, the cyanobacteria, the microcystis colonies love temperatures of 75, 77 degrees is optimal for them to get going. So we've got to keep our, we, we want to hope for not having more mild winters. Uh, we've got to do everything we can for climate change. And, and we've got to do everything we can to save our hemlocks, keeping these stream cools, streams cool, but also helping um, uh, give root structure on these steep banks. And one thing that's threatening them is the hemlock woolly adelgid that uh, many on the call and meeting might, might know about. And we just received, worked with Soil Water Conservation District, both Tisco Lake um, and Skinny Lake, we split on some uh, funds to uh, support grant writing through Soil Water Conservation District to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, where we received $50,000 that will be, uh, you know, uh, mobilizing uh, this uh, early winter, late winter and early spring uh, to get going between Atisco Lake and Skinny Atlas and areas that uh, hemlocks need help, um, you know, throughout this area. And additionally, Owasco Lake just started um, uh, a program to start understanding where uh, hemlock uh, woolly adelgid are, uh, these you know little insects that are killing our trees. And so that makes me feel very good that we've got uh, good neighboring lakes working on similar programs where we're uh, seeing a nice buffer because these bugs don't know watershed boundaries like raindrops. Um, so we, we need to uh, look at this as a cross-cutting uh, you know, strategy for um, for that. Okay, uh, and going on a couple layers, and um, here is some stream sampling sites that uh, between Upstate Freshwater Institute historically DEC sites uh, where they've done some sampling, and and Syracuse University and the Skinny House Lake Association. Um, just so there's a little bit there. Um, we it, also, this is where all of our uh, monitoring uh, volunteers are for harmful algal blooms. Oops. Um, and this is, we also, I'll talk about, we did a uh, campaign for folks to sign pledges to not use pesticides and to reduce chemicals on their lawns. Uh, this is, it needs to be updated, but I think we have over 200 individuals that have signed the pledge. I think this is where we have signs around uh, that that folks are saying, I signed the pledge and we're part of this program, we're gonna reduce chemicals going to the lake. Um, uh, Dr. Greg Boyer is starting to pilot dock mounted sensors looking for chlorophyll and uh, you know, as an indicator for harmful algal blooms. Uh, this is where the bloom optics preliminary sites were. Uh, and then our milfoil program, uh, I'll talk about uh, very briefly because I know we're running short on time, but. Uh, this is to, uh, we use benthic matting to reduce milfoil. This is our, our past year uh, places where we had the matting. Uh, and then we're trying to protect uh, at our, our main boat launches. Um, these are the main boat launches this past year where we had uh, many of our, um, our uh, stewards that the Lake Association helps uh, employ uh, to uh, you know, check boats at, at the, station, at the uh, launches. Um, so I'll kick back. That's uh, hopefully I didn't go too quick, but I know I do need to pick up the pace. Um, and let me stop sharing there and uh, get back to the PowerPoint slide.
there's the Brussels landing. I'm not sure if um, this will advance. I think I've got to click on it. So the milfoil program, um, this is the, uh, as I mentioned, the benthic matting program. We survey using uh, basically a, a sonar advanced fish finder to look at the how this milfoil um, grows. It grows at a certain height. Uh, so we survey each year uh, to see where we're going to put mats out for the next year. Um, and then uh, the city of Syracuse provides us some support in 2019, uh, cost us about uh, $70,000 uh, annually now uh, for our program. Uh, the city kicked in about 13 and a half for 2019 uh, just to help support this program. We really appreciated that. Uh, Onondaga County helps our milfoil uh, program. I think oh, you had a, uh, a, a contract through the county for 25,000. Uh, for our, our milfoil program, which costs over well over $100,000 annually to help protect the lake. Uh, significant funds going into this. Legacy funds are going into our watershed improvement projects. Um, but this is what we're really concerned about getting hydrilla out of the lake, or I'm sorry, preventing hydrilla from getting into Skinny Atlas Lake. Uh, milfoil is, is a big problem, but hydrilla is logarithmic, 10 times more prolific. And uh, it, it can be, Managed initially through benthic matting, uh, which is basically this: these mats kind of suffocate the the plants uh, that are put in. And uh, but uh, if it hits a point, uh, it would be a really difficult decision. Where similar to Cuga, where we would have to, if hydrilla got in the lake and got out of control beyond benthic matting, it would uh, need to be chemically uh, managed, which we don't want. Um, Here's some stats. I'm not gonna spend too much time with this, but this is just to show in three years how much pressure we're seeing at our, um, at our boat launches. Uh, you can see uh, the number of watercrafts over in three years went, went from 3,000. These are just the ones that are checked. We've uh, added more time on our, for our boat stewards to survey uh, a longer period of time, longer hours, you know, more days. Um, so that, that's an indicator, but it's also, uh, you know, 2019, I believe, is when we uh, had flooding. Uh, so a lot of the marinas on Lake Ontario and the Great Lakes were, um, you know, closed. So we saw some more folks there. And then certainly we, we anecdotally attribute this activity increase of pressure to uh, COVID, but also uh, more launches are going on. There's new launches at Onondaga Lake more launches at a Tisco, more, more boats coming through, more infrastructure, more use, more access. And, and New York State had a huge uptick uh, in, in boat sales this year because people are looking for safe activities to do. Um, but we, we are absolutely, our, our stewards were, were just overwhelmed, so busy this year. We, you know, the community helped keep them safe. We had good, uh, you know, practices in, in, um, in play, but we had to keep, uh, Keep them out, and the uh, amount of vegetation went from uh, uh, one three percent in 2018 of of the boats that came through. Three percent of them had some vegetation on them. Uh, this this past year was close to seven percent. Uh, so we are seeing increased stresses to the lake and and risks uh, to uh, you know introducing more invasives, which we have seen. Uh, we got round goby, just came, uh, reports of that, and starry stonewort, another invasive species that was just uh, noticed by the Cortland County uh, Soil Water Conservation District this year. I'm going to cruise through. Um, so more to come. We're always looking forward to collaborating and more doing more of that. We're working on a floating classroom. We've uh, put in uh, a funding request for um, and uh, I talked about this is the pledge we asked people to uh, sign and help. Uh, for those in the watershed, we're trying, we're starting to collect when, uh, you know, when runoff wreaks havoc. Uh, we want to build our case for support of these chocolate milk photos. Um, and uh, we're asking for support. Uh, you, you don't have to be a, a uh, live in the watershed to support the watershed. Uh, there's many communities that are benefiting. Uh, so we would love for everyone to uh, support our operations as we have surmounting needs uh, to um, 
consider a membership. We're asking our current members to even gift memberships for the holidays. Um, and then we have our legacy fund, and that's where we like to mobilize and use for these watershed improvement projects. This is a, a, a specific fund for educating and uh, mostly addressing these harmful algal blooms. Uh, is is all about trying to keep our lake safe. Um, so any support there is is greatly um, uh, greatly appreciated. And we can't do it alone. Uh, I highlighted the towns earlier. These are all the folks that we have to work with. We're working on watershed-wide governance to um, be a little more uh, formal at the at the table, but just as a mechanism to ensure our convening on a regular basis, uh, which we're already doing through our lake ecology team. And so that's the, the municipalities. Um, and, and these are a little bit of our NASCAR uh, logos um, of all the folks that are involved. And, and again, we, we can't, this is something that we're not in a vacuum. Uh, we're not in a silo. Uh, we have to even across uh, working with other lakes uh, in our communities and um, you know, our neighboring lakes, we, we have to all work together. Um, and part of that is our, um, our Skinny Atlas uh, Lake Ecology team uh, that we're uh, convening each month. Uh, these are some of our board members uh, that are part of it, but also uh, government folks that are uh, attending or invited to attend. Um, and then our uh, consultants and advisors um, you know, from various uh, not-for-profits and um, sporting groups like uh, Century Arc Land Trust with Rick Smartin on here, uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, um, you know, Amy with the DECs here, uh, Liz Moran, I think we're going to be reaching out to you a bit more to get you more involved. I, I'm sure uh, this is, I'll talk with our, our chair and get you, if you're interested in uh, attending these meetings, I think that would be really helpful. Uh, Anchor QEA, uh, we've uh, contracted with for these watershed improvement projects. You might know their work for the Onondaga Lake cleanup that they've done so well, and uh, we're, we're benefiting uh, for the lake community because of that. And that's it. I know, uh, Amy, my apologies if I cut in, but uh, I, I know there's just so much to cover on the lake, and I know there's uh, folks that I haven't been able to in, engage with, uh, so I thought I'd give a, a good comprehensive overview. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to John, Diane, and Amy. Thanks, Frank. Uh, so, Amy, I, I don't know if we've, uh, how much we've cut into your time, but uh, uh, we'll turn it over to you. You can share your screen. Yeah, no problem. Um, can you guys see that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm going to uh, take a little bit of a step back um, and talk briefly about um, just kind of history and the water quality of Skinny Atlas. So Frank touched a little bit on it, um, but I just kind of wanted to set the stage a little bit more to talk about lake water quality. Um, and in order to do this, I just wanted to provide a brief overview of trophic state. Um, so I think Frank talked about this a little bit. Skinny Atlas is an oligotrophic lake, which means it has very low biological productivity. Um, it has very low concentrations of nutrients, high oxygen, and relatively um, low chlorophyll. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have eutrophic lakes, which have high bi biological um, activity, usually excessive algal and plant growth, and that's usually due to high nutrients. Um, and all lakes go through some natural eutrophication process um, in which, you know, lakes that are oligotrophic and mesotrophic fill in with sediment and nutrients over centuries and centuries and eventually become eutrophic. However, um, human activities can accelerate that process for what we call cultural eutrophication. Um, and that's really what we're concerned about is trying to slow down the cultural eutrophication process and um, keep our lakes um, as oligotrophic or as low nutrient as possible. And I say, you know, on, on the screen, you can see under oligotrophic, um, they tend to have minor problems, minor algal blooms, but I have that starred because as Frank mentioned, and as I'll talk a little bit more about, um, they're still not immune to threats uh, facing uh, from invasive species, but uh, probably most notable harmful algal blooms. 
And so um, to understand trophic state, we can actually uh, assign a numerical score for a lake's water quality. Um, this was developed in the 1970s um, by Carlson and uh, we used chlorophyll A numbers, total phosphorus, which is the nutrient that we're most interested in, uh, especially in the Finger Lakes, and then water clarity. Um, and using those three, um, those uh, three numeric numbers, we can actually assign a trophic state score uh, to specific lakes. Um, the, so um, the lower the number in this case, the better the water quality. Um, and you can just see that, uh, you know, Skinny Atlas has an average TSI score of 28, which puts it firmly in the oligotrophic category um, by all measures of water quality. And you can see, you know, just in context with the rest of the Finger Lakes, Skinny Atlas has um, the best water quality. And I just also wanted to put it a little bit more in context with uh, the Finger Lakes, but also statewide. Um, so the lakes at the bottom of the screen are actually all 11 Finger Lakes from west to east. Um, so Canisius Lake uh, on the left for this west, um, and then Otisco on the, uh, in the east on the furthest right, and then um, New York State average, um, you can see in the box and whisker plus to the left. And you can just see if you're looking at Skinny Atlas, a few things, again, it's solidly, those are, you know, total phosphorus numbers, solidly in the oligotrophic category. Um, you could see it uh, has much lower concentrations of nutrients than in general New York State, um, but also in all of the Finger Lakes as well. And these numbers are from 2017 and 2018. This is just a snapshot in time, um, but we can actually go back through and see some numbers all the way back to the 1970s. Um, so this is uh, New York State DEC data all the way back to the 70s, again, Canisius um, to the west on the top left, Atisco to the east on the top, uh, or excuse me, on the bottom right, um, and then Skinny Atlas. Um, you can see for the most part, um, Skinny Atlas like phosphorus concentrations have not changed significantly over the past 50 years. Um, this is a good thing you can see in some other lakes like Cayuga, Seneca, and Honeyoy. Um, that phosphorus concentrations have significantly shifted over the last 50 years. So we know that Skinny Atlas Lake water quality hasn't changed too much in the last 50 years and that it's relatively good. But we can actually go uh, back even further, all the way back to um, 1910, Burge and Jude did a clarity study of the Finger Lakes. Um, so this is an incredibly valuable data set that we have um, from the early 1900s. And you can see, you know, a lot obviously has changed in the watershed in the last um, 120 years, but you can actually see the clarity, which is a really great water quality indicator, hasn't really changed much. Um, obviously that 19, early 1900 score is, is pretty deep, but the watershed was also significantly different back then. Um, so it's pretty impressive that we can look at it over the last 120 years and see that, again, Skinny Atlas Lake has very good water quality um, and it hasn't changed much. And I found this old postcard online. Um, this is at the south end of Skinny Atlas and you can see, you know, there's a lot of forested areas. There's not a lot of development. Um, so the watershed itself has actually changed quite a bit and developed a little bit more than where it was in the early 1900s. But again, water quality hasn't shifted that much. But that's not to say there aren't threats to the water quality. Um, and these threats, there's many different threats facing uh, lakes in New York State and, and the Finger Lakes, and they tend to be water body specific. It can be anything from, you know, again, cultural eutrophication, excess nutrients and sediment, potential wastewater uh, industrial discharges. This isn't too much of an issue in the Skinny Atlas watershed. Frank talked about invasive species like hydrilla um, and invasive mussels, um, but probably the most notable one that we've been thinking about and have been hearing a lot about is harmful algal blooms. So I mentioned that Skinny Atlas Lake has really good water quality and that it hasn't changed significantly over the last hundred years. However, as we all know, in 2017, um, Skinny Atlas experienced its first lake-wide harmful algal bloom. And this shocked a lot of people. Um, we never really thought that uh, a lake like Skinny Atlas would have conditions ripe for blooms, but obviously in 2017, uh, we learned otherwise. 
So just very briefly, we've talked a lot about HABs. Um, HABs stand for harmful algal blooms. They're also called cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. All are kind of interchangeable. The H stands for harmful because it has the ability to produce toxins. But beyond that, also it has the potential to be harmful for the local economy, for aesthetics of, um, of the lake, um, potentially impacting property values. So it goes, the harmful goes beyond just, you know, human health impacts due to the toxins. Uh, algal is actually kind of a misnomer. Um, freshwater habs are actually not al algae, they're cyanobacteria, um, but they do photosynthesize. So um, that mistake was made and I, you know, I guess the name stuck. Um, and then the B stands for blooms. Um, and blooms can take many forms. They can be lake-wide, like the picture we just saw um, off the Skinny Atlas Country Club. But um, in Skinny Atlas, they tend to be more small localized areas um, along a dock or along a shoreline, along people's property. Um, but they can take many different forms. So these guys are highly specialized and very competitive. Um, they're very old organisms. They're over 3 billion years old, so they've gotten have a lot of good practice to get um, to get good at what they do. Um, they're best in really high temperatures. That's why they tend to bloom later in the season in a lot of sunlight in low wind conditions and high nutrients. However, as indicated um, previously, uh, we are now finding HABs in low nutrient water bodies too, like Skinny Atlas, Lake Placid, and actually this year for the first time, Lake George. So we know the general um, contributors, conditions that contribute to blooms, but what triggers a bloom in a specific water body is still not fully understood. Um, so we think that there's some other ingredients um, for HABs, especially in the case um, for Skinny Atlas. As I mentioned, the nutrients haven't really changed too much in the lake, so evidence seems to indicate that nutrients may not be the driving force for HAB formation in at least Skinny Atlas. Um, but it is something that we can actually address. Um, we can't really address climate change. We know that um, lakes are getting warmer. We've seen that already happen. Um, there's actually been some research that have shown um, September's have been getting calmer, which is prime conditions for have bloom formation. And unfortunately, Skinny Atlas um, lake orientation and fetch make it a really good candidate for blooms as well. There's also been a lot of research about invasive mussels like zebra and quagga mussels having an impact. So we think that some of these other um, other ingredients for HABs are really, um, are the keys um, for driving blooms in, in Skinny Atlas, but it's in very complex, um, it's very complicated and we're, we're trying to understand that. So how are we addressing HABs in Skinny Atlas? Um, I'll start with the governor's four point HABs initiative. It was hit part of his state of the state proposal in 2018, um, it included uh, four harmful algal bloom summits statewide, bringing in experts from all across the country talking about bloom formation and mitigation strategies. Um, it, he also selected 12 priority lakes, which included Skinny Atlas to, um, to do action plans, which prioritized projects for our state funding opportunity. And then also um, he launched the HABs Advanced Monitoring Pilot and in-lake mitigation pilots, which I will not get into today, um, but is also very interesting. So um, we created a Skinny Atlas Lake Harmful Algal Bloom Action Plan. Um, so it includes just a summary of lake water quality and HABs history. Um, it looks at, you know, a statewide analysis and local water body analysis of potential HABs triggers. Um, and then it looked at potential lake and watershed implementation projects to address HABs. And um, some of those projects um, have already been applied and funded um, through uh, DEC's funding programs. So that's excellent. And I encourage anyone who's interested in that to take a look at that on our website. Um, I'll briefly mention our advanced monitoring pilot again. Uh, it included four strategies. Um, to develop and implement a comprehensive 
uh, water quality monitoring strategy that would inform the development of a statewide HABs monitoring strategy. Um, and so it include uh, monitoring platforms, um, a shoreline mapping, and tributary monitoring and like an intensive lake characterization. And Skinny Atlas was the only pilot lake that received all four strategies as part of the pilot program. We also established HAB surveillance programs, which Frank mentioned. Um, so we established them on eight of the 11 Finger Lakes, including Skinny Atlas. And we have bloom reports coming in from all 11 Finger Lakes. Um, so we currently have 34 zones set up on Skinny Atlas. We train new volunteers um, every year, and it has been a success since 2018. With that, um, we established our NIHABS uh, system, which is an interactive map. Um, which showcases HABS reports. It's updated near real time. So all of our volunteers throughout the Finger Lakes and also um, beyond statewide can report blooms. And you can actually go on our NIHAB system website. You can click around, um, you can click on you know, those little dots um, that would bring up, this is an example of an archive bloom in Honeyway Lake. And we'll actually bring up the pictures that um, were submitted with, with that Bloom report. So there's a lot of really great information. You can go on and actually filter by lake and download the reports. Um, so it's a really great resource and it's been really well received. And then we also um, continue our core monitoring programs on the lake. So we have our Citizen Statewide Lake Assessment Program, our CSLAP program which is um, our collaborative program with the Skinny Atlas Lake Association. So we have volunteers with the Lake Association that go out and monitor two sites on Skinny Atlas um, eight times per summer. It's a lot of the data I presented early on with CSLAB data from all of our great volunteers. It's been a great program. Um, DEC has paid for two sites for three years and now we pay for one site. Um, and SLA actually covers the additional site. So it's a really great collaborative project. Um, I mentioned the HABs Advanced Monitoring Program. We've also been out during the winter to collect um, winter limnology water quality data, um, which is as fun as it sounds. Um, we're out on all the Finger Lakes three times per winter collecting uh, really great data um, during that gap. You know, typically we get a lot of data collection in the summer, but um, not a lot of people want to be out there in mid-February collecting water samples, but um, we go out and do that, and that's been a really great data set as well. Um, we've also have our tributary monitoring programs, again, as part of the advanced monitoring program. Um, we also did a rapid assessment survey in four tributaries in 2019. And then we also pay for a USGS gauge on Grout Brook. And these are just the DEC monitoring programs. We've been very closely involved with um, SLA's monitoring programs. And we also are you know, very interested in the town of Skinny Atlas and the city of Syracuse's monitoring programs as well. So it's been a really great uh, collaborative project to talk about all of the monitoring. And I want to thank Frank and SLA again for hosting that data workshop last year. Um, that was a really great resource uh, for us. And it was a really great opportunity to talk about the data that everyone is collecting in the watershed. So I just want to finish talking briefly about clean water planning. Um, so we talk a lot about um, collecting data and trying to understand harmful algal blooms, but really how does that all fit into you know protecting skinny atlas um and in my my mind um i see all of this coming into clean water planning and what what clean water plans generically is, is just a watershed based approach to either improving or really in the case of skinny atlas protecting the water quality and there's two main types of clean water planning that we do um, in New York State. <clears throat> that includes nine element plans, which is what Skinny Atlas will be doing, and total maximum daily loads. Um, so the clean water planning documents, both the TMDLs and the nine element plans, they both do the same thing. Um, they take a look at the different watershed characteristics. They look at different pollutant sources and loads, so where the nutrients are coming from and what form of the nutrients is coming into the lake. 
Um, they try to figure out what allowable pollutant levels could be in a lake where the lake is still meeting its best uses. And it develops a strong implementation plan um, with adaptive management, um, which would recommend actions that will, again, improve or protect water quality. So some of the short term benefits um, is, you know, basically just an inventory of what's in the watershed. Um, in the case of Skinny Atlas, there's a lot of well established watershed monitoring programs. So it's really just doing an inventory of what programs exist and kind of bringing it all under one umbrella and then begin to understand and quantify what those nutrient and sediment impacts are and locate potential areas of concerns or you know, areas where we should be focusing our attention. And all of this takes a science-based uh, approach um, to make these decisions to allocate resources. So some of the longer term benefits, again, just a general understanding of how the system and the watershed works. Um, building partnerships for extended and effective management. In the case of Skinny Atlas, there's a ton of partnerships and groups that are already exist. Um, so rather than building the partnerships in Skinny Atlas, really enhancing those partnerships and improving in ways um, on how these different groups are working together. Um, and then really the whole point of a clean water plan is to create a common plan for all those different partners to utilize. And that is how they will take any future decision making um, and future management decisions. Um, and again, it's, it's to help focus the limited resources um, that we have so that, you know, we get our bang for our buck for implementing these projects. And probably one of the most important things is to implement this plan um, takes a lot of resources, obviously. Frank was talking about the Legacy Fund with the Skinny Atlas Lake Association. That's an incredible resource, um, but there's a lot of funding that is needed to complete these plans. And um, creating and finishing a nine element plan will actually give you higher eligibility for both state programs, so our programs, but also federal programs like the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. So why an INE plan for Skinny Atlas? So again, um, Skinny Atlas has great water quality. There are no impairments, though we do know that there are some threats, including harmful algal blooms and invasive species. Um, Non-point sources dominate uh, the loading inputs. There aren't any point source discharges in the Skinny Atlas watersheds. So the INE plan does better with um, non-point dominant watersheds. Um, 90 plans are also community driven and locally led. Frank talked about the extensive um, partnerships that already exist in the watershed. So relying on those um, relationships um, to accelerate the 90 plan will be key. And um, it will be a good opportunity for all of those groups to get involved and participate in the planning process. Um, and again, it's not just those groups that have been working in the watershed, um, but it's getting people involved um, from members of the general public to really participate um, and provide comment, not just at the end, um, but throughout the entire process of developing this plan. So these are the elements. Um, I've actually pretty much gone through all of them, but you know, identifying your sources of pollutants, determining what your water quality goal will be and figuring out how to reach that goal to reduce the loads. Um, and then, you know, putting together an implementation plan to meet that goal. Um, and, you know, this is gonna include complex analysis. Um, DEC is actually funding both an in-lake model and a watershed model that Liz, um, that Liz commented on at the beginning. So we're extremely excited to work with Liz and the Ramble team to put together um, both a watershed model to understand the nutrients and the land uses that are contributing nutrients <clears throat> to the lake, but also to understand what's going on in the lake itself. What are the processes that are going on with the lake that could um, be potentially contributing to harmful algal blooms or could be threats to water quality? <clears throat> And after all of that is understood, we really want to put together a strong implementation plan, um, recognizing there's certain things that we can't control. So a lot of those wild cards for HABs I was talking about, like climate change and sunlight and things like that, 
um, are very difficult to control. We can't, um, we're obviously not gonna turn around climate change overnight. Um, so water temperatures is really hard to control. Uh, we can't really control the sun or the wind, um, but there are some things that we can control. And there are some things that are good uh, management options for nutrient reduction and sediment reduction. Um, and there's a lot of really great partners in the watershed, like the Skinny Atlas Lake Ag Program, which the city of Syracuse funds. Um, SLA is involved with a lot of work. All the other Onondaga County, Keyuga County, um, they're all involved with a lot of the um, management, a lot of BMP, best management practice work throughout the watershed. So again, um, it's not doing work that hasn't been done before. It's just creating a common plan that all of these different groups um, can implement from and to capitalize on the existing work that's been in the water, been going on in the watershed um, and, and just enhance that work. Um, so I mentioned competitive statewide grant programs. So the implementation plan um, will uh, open the door for additional funding. Um, some, uh, some of those funding sources uh, have already been successfully applied for, like the Finger Lakes Land Trust, uh, the Central New York Land Trust, um, and the Nature Conservancy have been successful in receiving our WQIP, our Water Quality Improvement program funds to protect um, to protect land in the Skinny Atlas watershed. Um, so again, uh, a 90 plan will just further all of those existing efforts. And I just to end with, um, you know, we we do these plans to protect water quality. Um, it's very specific, but those threats I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we're hopeful that we can continue to protect Skinny Atlas against those threats um and protect against any potential cultural eutrophication um processes that could be happening in the watershed um and and so you know it's not necessarily the end all be all um but we're excited that clean water planning will again protect skinny atlas lake um by capitalizing on all of the existing partnerships that frank mentioned um and dec is looking forward to being and continuing to be part of that process so I know that was really fast, I apologize, but I was hoping we'd have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, thanks, Amy. That was that was wonderful, com comprehensive. Um, there, there is a question that Tom Hughes raised about the fisheries and the relationship between, uh, you know, uh, changes that might be being seen in the fishery and uh, inputs. Um, can you comment on, on that, uh, Tom's, uh, points are in the chat if you want to just take a quick <laughs> a, a quick look at uh, what he what he wrote yep. there yeah so um i'm not definitely not the best person to answer this but our fisheries folks are aware of the walleye situation in skinny atlas um and they are actively trying they're creating a management strategy now with um to figure out what the best opportunities are to mitigate walleye um because as it as I understand it, um, the walleye were introduced illegally um, and could be potentially impacting uh, native cold water fish. Um, so they are currently evaluating several different approaches to mitigating the walleye issue. Um, and I can put you in contact with our fisheries folks. Um, I, I'm not sure where that stands right now, but I know they're in the process of creating a plan that will go out for public comment. Cool. Right. Can you hear me okay, Amy? I just wanted to mm -hmm. quick follow up too. Like I, I definitely know some secondhand information from the DEC folks. I was just curious since we were talking so much about water quality and you know, sort of this, you know, potential for more eutrophication, you know, this oligotrophic eutrophic shift, if it mm -hmm. were to be, you know, that extreme, or is there something that could occur over time that might favor, you know, from a trophic you know, point of view, you know, right down from planktonic communities to, you know, predator prey, um, you know, is there anything that would sneak in there with regard to a predator like walleye? So I could certainly follow up with with the folks down at the 
DEC office too. Yeah, and definitely, and that's something that you know we're considering. Um, I think the the positive is we haven't really seen a drastic increase in nutrients um, at this point, and I can't imagine um, anything drastic you know, occurring in the near future, at least, you know, eutrophication, especially natural is, you know, it takes centuries and centuries. Um, so it's not something we're worried about right now. And it appears that the nutrient concentrations have remained relatively constant. Um, and it would take quite a, quite an increase in nutrients to really affect um, the fisheries population and cause it to shift to a different um, fish population. So I think the nutrients we're okay with, but then of course there are other threats facing fish um, and that includes the walleye. Yeah. Amy, Tom, uh, Tom brought also up a good, interesting point of how harmful algal blooms or microcystin toxins uh, can impact wildlife. It, have you noticed anything being selective in, na in nature? Um, where it can impact, you know, some fish over others or some wildlife over others related to the... Yeah, uh, um, that's a good this. question. I, I'm not familiar with any research showing negative impacts to fish from blooms alone. Um, sometimes when the blooms die off, they can create uh, low oxygen conditions and that could affect, um, obviously, fish in those areas. But the blooms themselves, I haven't I don't think I've seen any research indicating the toxins um, impacting the fish themselves. It's rather when they die off and create those low oxygen conditions. Thanks, Amy. I see that uh, Javed has a uh, comment he would like to share. You can unmute then. Uh, hello again, and thank you for your presentations. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I uh, have we have some kind of these problems in my country, and uh, we right now we are working on floating islands that there are some kind of uh, uh, um, herbs are we are planting some herbs across the river across the shore shore side of. Uh, lakes to m mitigate the nutrition uh, that are coming through the streams and through the soil into the lake. Did you uh, ever um, learn about that, uh, learn about the uh, island, uh, floating islands? Um, that's not something we've really looked into. Um, you know, I've heard about it on a smaller scale basis um, in like constructed wetlands, um, but I don't know if I've heard about that application on such a large scale in a lake like the size of Skinny Atlas. Um, Frank, you have know, you? Of course, for small sizes, but consider that you, have, when you're doing these in the right now, uh, we are working the, this kind of, uh, for mitigating the eutrophication, we are using this technique uh, inside dams, inside uh, reservoirs, because of some, some of our dams have this kind of problems, that we are, have a, a steam slopes and the, the nutrition can easily flow through the stream to the lake or to the reservoir. So we are right now constructing them and analyzing, and they are very efficient in our jobs that we did. Uh, and we are right now working on a specific dam to uh, analyze it. And there are, we are going to finalize it uh, about uh, six months, five months. After that, I can say that it, can it work or not? But uh, our uh, first and our uh, first aspects are working good. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm interested if you want to send more information. Um, it sounds uh, maybe a little similar to buffers. Um, so and um, we that's something that we have been advocating for is, uh, you know, riparian buffers, forested buffers along tributaries that lead to the lake um, to help slow down any potential runoff. And then, Frank, if you want to talk about maybe the lake friendly lawn care, that's also a really great opportunity. But um, if you wanted to send me more information, I'd love to take a look at it. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say it's, it 
certainly intriguing, and I'm wondering, in, in, you know, if these are uh, bio or engineered islands, uh, what what kind of uh, utility they might have if they're placed, uh, you know, at, at the mouths of, uh, you know, near the streams um, that are that are loading in. Uh, interesting in lake. Uh, concept, but it also would be, uh, you know, I'd have to defer to Amy and DEC to see if, if that type of concept would be permissible, uh, you know, under the current, uh, you know, authorities and what. But mm -hmm. the concept sounds very interesting and, and something, uh, you know, that has merit to to bring up and discuss uh, and look into more. Yeah, I will send some links uh, for you team uh, that will help your problems I, I guess i think it would it could have solve the problems thank you very much yeah, I, I i would say javed if you could uh, if you have a link handy now you can put it in the chat uh but otherwise if you uh you know contact any of us by uh, uh email we would like to uh find out more about your suggestion just a quick question. Where are these islands? Sure, Jared? of course. What? A quick question. Whereabouts are these islands you're, that you're working on? I'm sorry. I didn't get that. Uh, actually, uh, the, if you know that uh, I live in Iran, uh, we have a part in uh, Kurdistan provinces. Our Kurdistan provinces have steep slopes like your lake, and we have uh, lots of eutrophication. Our dams there are very eutrophicated. So, in order to make uh, the nutrition, are uh, do you have my voice? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, we do. Uh, because of we have lots of uh, eutrophication, eutrophicated dams, uh, then we consider that it will go. Uh, this strategy can help us, and then we start to construct the. Uh, first uh, prototype kind of uh, prototype uh, lake and we uh, harvest some herbs there and find out that it can help our streams uh, uh, dams streams to mitigate the nutrition that are coming inside well thank you thank you you're welcome yeah yeah, thank you. I don't, I don't see um, any other questions there, but uh, Amy, something that came up at the last month's meeting when we were talking about the UN Biosphere Program was, uh, and, and, and I haven't looked into it any, any further myself, but I was wondering are, are you, if you're familiar with the UN uh, Biosphere Program. Um, the suggestion was made by Professor Carter uh, from uh, SUNY ESF that uh, maybe the Skinialis or the, uh, the Finger Lakes region of New York State might be a prime candidate to create uh, a biosphere uh, designation. Um, are you familiar with that? And does that have any uh, uh, merit? I am not familiar with that, um, so I can't comment on whether or not it has merit, but uh, I'd love to know more about it. Okay, well, I guess I'll have to do some digging myself. Then. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Are there other... Uh, questions that people have we're, we're we've run over a little bit and i appreciate everybody for uh hanging in there we've lost a few people um uh but uh I, i'll give you uh going uh, once maybe uh, going twice um uh, uh last chance and uh, I, I, so I think we're probably done with people's uh, 